works car, long nose D-type, um, which is owned by the Jaguar Heritage Trust and has been in their possession for probably 30 years. It spent a long time in a museum in Italy where it was um, repatriated uh, back to the UK and it's been in the Jaguar collection ever since. And it's, uh, it's a works car that actually ran at the mall and we're here at Hampton Court because Clive Beecham has organised a celebration of the 1957 Le Mans win. We all knew that Jaguar's finest moment was probably in 1957 when the cars, the D-types, came first, second, third, fourth and sixth. Um, and though they'd won it in uh, 1956 with the Akuri Akash short nose car and in 1955 with Mike Hawthorne in what was a slightly disturbing finish, I suppose, because of the tragedy, uh, 57 was a completely untainted, uh, fantastic um, performance by the Jaguar team. Every single D-type that was entered, finished. Finish. Yeah. And so, obviously we knew this was coming, 60 years, and um, I was waiting for somebody to do something to <laughs> celebrate this. So two things um, started to happen. Uh, one, I thought, well, can we at least drive down from Coventry, like they're used to, and, and drive to perhaps uh, towards Goodwood and, importantly, Hampton Court. So I got in touch with um, James Brooks Ward of the concourse, and he said, great idea, love to have the cars. Um, I got in touch And this with, was at Hampton Court? At Hampton course. Court for the yeah. concourse. I got in touch with Peter Reid, of um, head of motoring at the RAC, and he was couldn't have been more enthusiastic or helpful. And um, and we started to get the ball rolling. Now, concurrent with that, because I've got an Acuria cost car, I knew that aside from Norman Dewis, who is the senior father of all things Jaguar, at ninety five uh, is he now? I, I think, think he. I think he's almost ninety seven now. Yes. So I think he was must have been ninety six at that stage. But anyway. <laughs> Older than you and me, yeah. virtually put together. Put together. But, but uh, anyway, uh, and with um, a much better memory than either of us. Oh, he's a remarkable. <laughs> remarkable. Um, I knew that in Australia there was uh, one of these special mechanics called Ron Gordian. And um, I arranged for him to come over uh, to be there for the celebration because only he and Norman have the history that goes back to those particular days. And actually, Ron's history was even, to a certain extent, more pertinent and unique. Because he actually engineered the car. He, he spanned the 1955 winner, he spanned the 1956 winner, and he spanned the 1957 winner. I mean, there can't yeah. be many people who actually did that. I well, mean, well, nobody else did all three. No. Um, well, no, that's not true, of course, because Stan... Uh, no, nobody else did all three, because in 55 it was a works car. Of course, and when he came over from Australia, he got a job with Jaguar Works to begin with. That's right, and then he moved to a Curia Cost. And then he moved to a Curia Cost. Yeah. Uh, I arranged for him to come over. British Airways were wonderful because they... Um, paid for for the flights which was fantastic that is fantastic he stayed with me for two weeks jaguar very much came on board and uh, tim hannig and uh, his crew really pulled the stops out to arrange something and so the final um trip if you want is that we got the cars that came first second and third being the laumans museum car, car your car my car which came second and then uh uh, Jörg Holleis from Austria, from Austria, who had number 17. That's it. Um, the bright blue car. The, bright, the French blue car. French the blue, blue car, car that, came, yeah. that came third. Those three all said yes straight away. I was actually in South Africa Christmas a year ago, and so I went to the uh, museum. Jan Rupert, he owns it, and saw the curator, and they were actually quite enthusiastic about getting their car, which is a Franco Chant car in yeah. yellow. Um, a well, short I had short that nose car there in 2006. Did you? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, lo lovely car. Just before John Coombe sold it. <laughs> right. Well, that's a lovely car. And, um, and they wanted to bring it over. But the problem is that if you take a car like that out of South Africa and it's in trust, it's very difficult to get it in. And they weren't sure that they would be able to get the car back in again. Right, OK. So eventually they said no. And the car that came six, which was um, uh, Duncan Hamilton's car, <laughs> 2CPG is, is, yeah. CPG is now owned by Ralph Lauren yep. and it was I and think too much of an exercise. doesn't go out very often. No, and it was quite an exercise. So they, they considered it, they gave it consideration. It would have been lovely if they had it. But instead of that car, we pulled in two others. Um, we had another car that came six in 1956, the Hawthorne 
car, and that's owned, of course, by Jaguar themselves. So we had 605 there. And um, also then Christian Glacel, who owns the third Acuri long no uh, cost long nose, long nose. nose car, um, came along with his car as well. Yeah. So as a result of that, there are only six long nose cars left in the world, actually. And actually, if thinking about it, only two British racing green ones. Jaguar owns one. Yep. And Ralph Lauren owns well, the other. Well, Heritage Trust. Beg owns, your pardon. Yeah. Yep. To be quite to crystal be, clear. Absolutely. Get that one clear. We should get that on record, of course. It's the Heritage Trust. <laughs> yeah. uh, they own one, and uh, Ralph Lauren owns the other. Yeah. The other four long noses that exist, three of them are the Acuria Cost cars, and all three of them were there. And the only other long nose car in existence is the one that's owned by the Collier Museum which is white with blue stripes and has the Momo modifications. It's so an incredibly Cunningham. original car, Cunningham, Cunningham car. car. Yeah. Wonderful car as well. Very, very original. Like, like 603, which yeah. is also, I think, the only, only the Cunningham car and 603 have actually got their original interiors and are stupendously original, both of those cars. So out of the six long noses that exist in the world, we had four of them there, and it was an absolute privilege to have them. And uh, we arranged uh, that we would leave from the Jaguar Heritage, their new headquarters. So that's in Coventry, isn't it? In the Coventry, old right in, a, a, an old Wrighton plant. And yeah. we got shown around there. Um, and we had the old van there as well. Um, looking well, there. we'll talk about this in a moment, Clive, because oh. it's a wonderful, wonderful Artifact. thing. And our first stop was at my grandfather's house. That's Waterbury. correct, which I've never been for, to before. But I think most of us who are even passing students of um, Jaguar will have always seen that in the background. I mean, your grandfather must have used it for many product launches. He did. He, he used to, well, not so much launches, but actually styling exercises. So he would have a car that he was working on in the design shop brought out there right. to his home. And it could be in the middle of a weekend. It could be a Sunday morning. Right. And he would have it put up there and held together with blocks of wood underneath it so that he could get the bumpers in the right Just position. Just walk around it. In and the, walk the, around the, it yeah. and move bumpers and try different bumpers. And he did that in the setting of his own home. Well, I empathise with that a lot. I mean, I'm actually a chocolate manufacturer and, and you know, I, I stare at products sometimes, you know, just even when it comes from the art department, I used to just stare at it until you feel you that it, it right. looks right. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think particularly with cars, I find it, you know, it's, it's fascinating, really. But with cars, sometimes the great designs look slightly quirky when you first see them. The not so great designs you get straight away because actually they're almost contemporary and you know you they're, they're not pushing boundaries but the great designs take just that little bit of time to get used to sometimes and then they and it's settle. often just fine fine, fine tuning. tuning your granddad must have had the most phenomenal eye that's all and and very lucky to have of course malcolm sayer there too absolutely to, for the penmanship though he did the xk120 without him didn't he, he did yeah. he did the 120 before before so he, 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 before know, he knew arrived. his onions did he your did. granddad didn't he did, he? He did. <laughs> and even the ss 100 i think you know you have to say is a, a lovely looking car. is a lovely looking really car. i mean gorgeous looking car as well yeah so yes we went to um the hall and we lined all the cars up for a photo shoot and uh, we had Ron, I had Ron Gordian with me in my car. The Laumans were in theirs. Uh, Christian was uh, with a journalist, I think. You were in uh, one I of the cars. I was driving cars. the trust car with Martin Hollingsworth. Well, Martin yep. Hollingsworth. Yep. And, uh, and David Brazil was trying hard to keep up with the van <laughs> behind its top speed of 45. And I, I'm not sure how well we observed the uh, speed limits, but we drove from there down to Silverstone. And the people at Silverstone, we went to the technical college because I thought it would be good for the young engineers of today to be able to see the old engineering of days of yore. Um, and uh, we stopped off at the college. And they allowed us to go around the track for a few laps, which was very nice. Um, and we had Octane magazine there as well, and they did their cover shoots, and that was fun. And then we went on to, um, from there, we drove across country to uh, Williams Engineering. To Williams Grand Prix, yeah. And I think the people were looking out of the windows of Williams Engineering and thinking, what the <laughs> hell's going on here? <laughs> anyway, we lined up and a lot of the, um, the, the staff came out. It was around about lunchtime anyway. And they came out and they looked at it. And again, you've got these engineers of today looking at what was the most advanced car I mean, this was aerodynamically. State of the art in the mid 1950s, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Not in, you know, in terms of bodywork, in terms of the brakes, in terms of the bag tank, the, the dry design. sun, the chassis, yeah. and the monocoque. You know, it's, yeah. it's just, it was really, I call it the Spitfire of the road. Yeah. And I think that's just what it is. 
Yeah. Um, and certainly driving one, it feels like that. It does, it? and the noise is very much like that yeah. as well. Really evocative. Um, we, had, we had lunch there at Williams, and um, then we were privileged to see Frank Williams um, come into the hall, and he greeted us all. Um, and it was a, a, a lovely moment. You know, he took the time out to see each and every one of us. And then eventually we packed up and we drove out. And probably the most memorable moment of the whole tour, I think, took place then. I mean, you'll remember that. Yeah. Yes. I remember it well. So as we're driving out of the gates, there's a figure in a wheelchair right by the barrier so that we're almost out on the road. And as we drive past, this figure in his wheelchair is, is waving at us. And it's Frank Williams himself. And, and he all the way out of the factory gates to watch us go and wave us goodbye. I thought that was incredible. Very moving, wasn't it? Yeah. Really, I mean, actually, once a racer, always, always a, a racer. racer. And, uh, and, and what was special about that is because we weren't expecting that. And when you get something so special like that and it is unexpected, it made it, I, mean, I think we were all choking up, yeah. uh, 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 you know, well, as, again, as we drove away. Well, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Yeah. It was just extraordinary. Well, then we blasted down towards the, um, uh, the RAC um, Country Club. In Epsom. In Epsom. Yep. Courtesy, what was it, of the M3? Uh, M, M3, M25. M25. Yeah. Now, when I organised this tour, <laughs> I was promised that we would have police escorts. Ah. Because I anticipated that we might need them. Needless to say, when you get to the M25 on a rush hour, was it a Friday? Uh, Thursday. It was on a Thursday. Uh, rush hour Thursday. It was five o'clock. Yeah. I think that when Sir William Lyons and Malcolm Sir designed the D-Type, they didn't really have the M25 at rush hour in mind. <laughs> well, they certainly did. <laughs> they did not. They couldn't have conceived such a thing. No. <laughs> and I don't think the cars are well suited to it. I mean, they managed. But before, well, of course, before we got there, mind you, didn't we have the most fantastic time? You had these five D-Types line abreast or fanned out across the M3 motorway. What the rest of the world must have thought about when they saw these things flying along, I have no idea, because the noise was incredible and the cars are so raw and, you know, you've got people driving these things with no helmets or yeah. some with helmets, but I mean, it's just... Well, I remember looking at some of the passengers in the other cars and all the faces were pushed up against the windows and they'd never seen anything like it. No, or, or probably heard anything like it as well. I the mean, noise. the noise was just, you know, to see a complete line, of, a squadron of road going spitfires kind of flying yeah, down the m3 something. was great and anyway then we slammed straight into very very heavy m25 <laughs> um traffic some of the cars are set up more for racing than others mm. and um, some clutches are better than others <laughs> we staggered to the um rac clubhouse and there the rac put on the most fantastic um display for us they had tents to cover up the cars for night they discussed they'd invited um some of their members with jaguar cars um to come along we had c types we had 120s we had ss 100s it was it was lovely really nice thank you peter reed thank you um, everybody at the rac for um what what you did and then we had a dinner norman was there he was interviewed and he talked Ron was interviewed ron was interviewed. ben cousins gave a really good interview to, really to good ron. and of course yeah. because Ron's from down under and very few people even knew he existed. His stories were the first time most people had heard of, heard of these stories. Following day we drove over to Brooklands and Brooklands is significant because the three Acuria Cost cars in particular raced on the banking at Monza in 1957 and 1958. As a matter of fact um, 606 which won and 603 which came second were loaded up by Ron and Sandy Arthur onto the old not the one, the, the Curia Cost transporter we know of today, because that never really actually came until 1959. Mm. But in their pomp, they, they had these old Leyland buses which carried these um, these D types, and um, they they had the two uh, they had the bus, and they um, took the two cars down immediately from Le Mans to Monza, unloaded them, and no no change of engine or anything up they went against the indie cars because it was called it's a special race called the race of two worlds where you had the the best drivers in america in their indie cars coming over supposed to be driving against the best cars in europe mm -hmm. and, and the best drivers the european drivers thought that it was just too dangerous um, to drive these cars and all of them bar one and the three Uri curia cost cars dropped away. So um, David Murray became a hero in the eyes of the Americans 
And um, as it happened, Jack Fairman in my car, um, who didn't necessarily qualify that well, but um, the Jags have got four speeds and the Indy cars have only got two speeds. And uh, I think there was a prize of some champagne bottles or money for whoever leads on the first lap. And as they were led off round the banking uh, by uh, a, a, an Alpha Pace cars, Thurman realized that he had four gears, so he dropped it and he just blasted Lord. ahead of all the Indy cars. And I've got this wonderful film of um, the cars coming round in black and white with the American commentator talking about the Indy cars. And he said, oh, what's this? <laughs> There's a Jaguar taking the lead. And there he goes. And then you see uh, uh, the champagne. Uh, Flaming the Champagne. And you've also got um, stories of him actually going so high on the banking, and Ron, Ron told us about that, that they actually took the straps and uh, just a skin of paint off the, side of the, uh, off the side of the car. So there was a barrier lining the edge of the track. Absolutely, you're right up there on the banking, you know, I mean, you're that, and you're going 150 miles an hour and you know all about it. And you'll remember that at Brooklands, I mean, did you try and walk up that banking? I did. You know, well, you couldn't. You can't. <laughs> and it's yeah. apparently steeper at Monza. Yeah. Um, so it's just, uh, you've got to have big balls, pardon yeah. the expression, that to keep your foot in yeah. and actually keep the speed up. Because of course, if you take your foot off, then yeah. you're in trouble. Then you're in trouble, it's, 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 absolutely. Oh. Now Clive, tell me about the van. I mean, I, this I absolutely adore. Um, it's a wonderful evocation, would that be right? Correct. So, I mean, the... you want to get this on the record straight away. It is not the or an original Jaguar works van. I don't think they exist. And if they did, nobody would know that they exist. Yeah. I'm sure my grandfather would have made sure they were properly sold off <laughs> and accounted for. <laughs> yes. Well, when I got the D-Type, I thought, what exists for Jaguar? And um, the, you know, of course, Jaguar used to drive, they used, they used to drive the works cars from Coventry down to Le Mans to the races. Um, a Curia Cos at this, at this stage, we're using the Leyland buses, which I don't think are anywhere to be found. No. Um, and Dick did the most fantastic job on the Curie Cost Transporter. So I began to think, well, what did Jaguar use? And so I, I worked with the Heritage Trust and people and found out that, you know, you've got, had these Bedford KV vans. Now, these are rear of hen's teeth, believe it or not. I, I mean, you, you cannot, I, I looked for two years to buy one. There's a friend of both of us called Aubrey Finberg, yep. who owns a C-Type. He's yep. been looking for 10 years for one. Okay. And he virtually bit my head off when he found out. I bought so this. He, he, was, he was not pleased. I mean, he's, he's been very nice and gracious about <laughs> it, but he, he, he really it shows you how difficult it has been to find. Okay. I eventually, so where, do, where did you find it? I found it at the John Mould Museum in Reading. I'd originally rung them at the beginning of my two year search. And you know, timing's everything in life and um, they said no. But um, curiously enough, my, my father-in-law met the curator of the museum and he, he said, look, why don't you ask Clive to give us a ring? And I gave him a ring and um, they said, okay, we'll sell it. I, I, you know, I'd like to think that I'm reasonably good at business, but I've got to tell you the negotiation was incredibly one-sided. <laughs> um, and, and I was given the price and that was it. And that was it. I hadn't told them what it was for because I figured that the price would go up even more if I told them that it was for, you know, to partner a, a, a works D-type. But when I did tell him after we'd shaken hands, they said, oh, well, you'll be pleased to know that the van's in British Racing Green. Ah. <laughs> and I said, well, unfortunately, Jaguar always had them in blue. Do you know why they were in blue? I have no idea. I know that they had the, the old Jaguar logo on the side. Yep. Um, I've seen the Bedford CA vans, the, small, the smaller vans, and they had the Jaguar logo on the back, though I didn't have a picture of the back of a van. So I put the Jaguar logo on the back, and this I thought I would do. And I, I, I actually reckon that your granddad, because, you know, if you look at the 150s and the 140s, it does say Winners Le Mans. The boot badge. Oh, and, on the, and on the nose badges as well, don't okay. they? And so I think that if he had a car, a van that was driving around in those days, he, would, with great pride, would, would have had yeah. something along those lines, maybe on the back. But I can't say that that was there. This definitely was on the back of the vans. Yeah, I've seen pictures of that. So that's the it's van, and, and you know, does a full 45 miles an hour I was going following to say, wind. You know? Yeah, it, it, now David drove this down, didn't he? David he did, Brazel, yes. who looks after your cars. It's the only time I, he's ever driven anything of mine that's connected with Jaguar that he hasn't had a speeding ticket for. 
<laughs> it sounds like the XJ13, doesn't it? A little bit. Yeah. So it's a very rare sight to see them all together like this. And uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be part of it. Thank you.